Brill is distinguished between fundamentalism and other forms of religious belief. Just as followers of bin Laden will say that all infidels are damned, so these hyper-atheists say that all religion is equally contemptible. It seems to me that's like saying that fascists and liberals are really the same because both of them believe in politics. It's a grotesque parody of religious thought. And they attack a particular form of literalism which grew up in response to scientific attack in the 19th century, and they seem entirely unaware that literalism was confronted, for example, by St. Augustine, who did not believe that the world was created in six days, nearly 1,500 years earlier. So tonight, I'm not trying to prove the truth of Christianity or the existence of God, though I believe in them. It's not in my power to do that. But I'm asking us to turn away from fundamentalism and search for truth instead. It seems to me that the fundamentalist atheist assumes his superiority in advance, just like Calvinists who believe that they are one of the elect. He speaks from a lofty eminence. In an extraordinary passage in his book, Professor Dawkins point out, points out that members of Mensa, the society of people with a high IQ, tend to be atheists. He also says that there are few atheists in prison. Therefore, he thinks, atheists are better, brighter people than believers. Like a clever schoolboy, he thinks that only brain power matters. Well, there are plenty of examples of brain power being put to bad use. What Winston Churchill famously called the lights of perverted science have beamed with a particularly ghastly brightness in modern times. I expect that Dr. Mengele, who conducted live experiments on children for the Nazis, was a man of very high IQ. But that's not my main point. My main point here is that Professor Dawkins' attitude to the life of the mind is one of conquest. He quotes approvingly the view that most scientists are bored by what they have already discovered. Most scientists are bored by what they have already discovered. Like Alexander the Great with territory or Rupert Murdoch with media outlets, they're always grabbing more. And he thinks that's good. But surely this is a bad set of attitudes. Far be it from me to disparage brain power, I thank God, literally, I thank God, for the achievements of science and for all other intellectual achievements. But is it really the case that human beings are less valuable because they are stupid or ill-educated or poor or sick or disabled? The African peasant woman who sacrifices herself to, to save her starving child stands higher, in some important sense, even than the president of the Royal Society, though I have no objection to that distinguished gentleman. The prisoner whose faith Professor Dawkins looks down on with such disdain understands something about the human predicament which is to, denied to those who worship only success. It's a unique feature of serious religion that it appeals both to some of the best minds who have ever lived and to the most unfortunate people in the world. It is also often very clearly grasped, and this is something which Professor Dawkins really hates, by children. Now why? Why do the great religions, especially Christianity, put such store by the poor and the weak, the very young and the very old? I think it is we, because we can see what Cardinal Newman called the greatness and the littleness of man. We see the huge human capacity for achievement, invention, heroism, beauty and love juxtaposed sometimes in the very same human beings with cruelty, vanity, hatred, greed, and violence. And we're therefore profoundly unconvinced by explanations which are reductive and self-aggrandizing. We know that a world run by members of Mensa would not be a better place. And instead, we are attracted by paradox. We recognize truth in sentences which say that only when you are poor can you be rich, only when you are weak can you be strong, only when you die can you live. We do not abandon the power of reason, 
but we are aware of the ineradicable incongruity of our existence, as I say, our greatness and our littleness. So how could we be bored by what we have already discovered? We're fascinated by it. We can never stop reflecting on life's beauty and happiness, sadness and strangeness. And this means that we embrace forms of thought and communication which fundamentalists deride. When Professor Dawkins sees two pieces of wood uh, traversing one another at right angles, perhaps he sees only a plus sign or perhaps only the wood. But a Christian cannot see the plain wood, this plain wood, without thinking of the cross on which Jesus suffered and died. And as he surveys that cross or holds it, he will remember his belief that from death on that cross came the conquest of death. So for us, the whole world in its most daily occurrences, in bread or wine or a piece of wood, is charged with the deepest meaning. And we rediscover that every day. So what we are saying to Professor Dawkins and Professor Grayling and all the rest of these fundamentalists tonight is what Hamlet says to Horatio. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> well, I, I'd certainly make an observation at this stage, that, which is that the atheists are slightly better timekeepers. 